<laughs> Matey's Thrive Nation, it's an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Bill Harris on the show. He's an Omega-3 expert. He's actually a fatty acid expert. He's been doing this, I think, testing since 1980. That's 43 years in the science field. He's a professor at the School of Medicine, Sanford. It's an honor to have you on the show. Great to be here. I'm looking forward to it, Steve. Brilliant. And I've got some sort of practical examples. I've got my EPA, DHA supplements here, a couple. I've got some fish here, salmon and mackerel and sardines to have a look at uh, just how important this uh, area of you know health and wellness is. And I've been singing this song now as a physician now for 24 years, end of this year, 25 years. But uh, it hasn't been taken up very, very easy by traditional Western sort of medicine, uh, and I know things have changed in the States, but let's start with a little bit of your background, Dr. Bill, because I think uh, you've got the science and the experience. Yeah, um, again, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, interesting, always love to talk about omega-3 and omega-6 occasionally as we get over there. Yeah. Um, background, uh, a PhD in nutrition uh, in 78. Uh, <clears throat> University of Minnesota. Uh, I then work uh, with um, my original mentor named Dr. Bill Connor, who was in Portland, Oregon. And uh, Bill was the one who uh, first assigned me to, to a project that related to fish oils. Yeah. Uh, he wanted me to study the effects of uh, giving people a ton of salmon oil, what that did to their blood cholesterol and blood triglyceride levels. Um, and so that was my uh, first big step into this field. And uh, thankfully, it's been a very uh, productive field over the last 40 some years and continue promises to continue to be in the future. There's a lot of interest and a lot of, of to be discovered, I think. And as you mentioned, uh, to be applied mm. in the omega-3 space. Brilliant. Let's start with a high view of what is a saturated fatty acid, a MUFA, a PUFA, I think gives sort of a bit of a perspective on how important fatty acids are. Sure, sure. Uh, fatty acids are chemicals, like every, everything we eat is a chemical. Um, fatty acids are the ones, if you picture in your mind a uh, stick of butter, uh, you picture a bottle of vegetable oil sitting on the shelf, uh, you picture the uh, white fat on a piece of beef, that's pretty much fat. And that is made up of fatty acids, virtually 95% fatty acids. And fatty acids are uh, <clears throat> long chains of carbon atoms hooked together by either single or double bonds. Uh, it depends on the fatty acid. Um, if they're, if the fatty acid, and it usually they're typically between say 12 and 22 carbons long in this chain. Um, if all the bonds in the molecule, all the carbon atoms are held together by single bonds, we call, we call it a saturated fatty acid uh, because it's saturated with hydrogen atoms, which you almost need pictures to show this, but in any event, it's not saturated. If there is even one double bond in that chain of carbon atoms, we call it an unsaturated fatty acid. Um, and if there's two or more double bonds in that molecule, we call it a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Uh, so, and so obviously a one double bond monounsaturated fatty acid, MUFA, as you said, and polyunsaturated PUFA. And then there are subclasses within, particularly the PUFAs, two general families within the PUFA class, the omega-6 and the omega-3. Brilliant. Maybe just speak a bit about omega-9 and the reason I say that, and uh, because I think it's important, or omega-7, the test that we do, and we want to speak about omega-quant because I really want to chat to you possibly after the show. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we want to try and get it here into Africa and really offer it to patients and clients. We are doing testing at the moment, but I just, it's been so valuable to my patients, my clients, my corporates, uh, testing and for people to have an objective assessment on their index, the Omega index, three index, as well as obviously the ratio. Uh, I've listened to you a lot, so we'll, you know, discuss that, debate that and, and, and look at it, which I think is very, very important. But Omega 7s, Omega 9s, give us your perspective on that. Yeah, uh, and just let me back up to Omega. 
just what is that where did that ever come from it's not just a science fiction word that some somebody thought was cool uh, of course there omega is the last letter of the greek alphabet alpha is the first and in chemistry when we're naming fatty acids we're describing fatty acids in chemistry we are um we often describe them ha having to do with the alpha and the alpha and the omega carbon the first right. and the last uh, and the first carbon in a fatty acid is called the alpha carbon. The last one's called the omega carbon. And so regardless of how many carbon atoms there are, there's always a first and a last. Um, if we focus on the omega N and we count back how many carbons until we hit the first double bond, we end up with either three or six or seven or nine single bonds before we hit the first double bond. And each one of those little families, the, the ones that have the omega minus three, minus six, minus seven, minus nine, each one of those is a little family. Uh, the, the, the major ones you alluded to, uh, I mentioned omega three and omega six. Omega nine is the uh, biggest, probably, in terms of how much uh, we eat. We eat more omega nine and we make, we synthesize ourselves omega nine fatty acids. Uh, very easily. That's the classically oleic acid, 18 carbons, one double bond. Uh, that fatty acid is very rich in olive oil, hence the name oleic, um, and in and in uh, <clears throat> canola oil and certain other high oleic safflowers, sunflower oils. Anyway, omega-9 is there. It's in the diet. It's a major part of the fat composition. Uh, and we can synthesize it. If we don't eat it, we can synthesize it from simple carbohydrates or proteins. Uh, the omega-3s and omega-6s are different. You cannot, we cannot synthesize those. So they are called essential. Um, omega-7, there's a there's recently a little, a little interest, new interest in uh, one of the omega-7 fatty acids called palmitoleic acid, which is 16 carbons, one double bond, omega-7 position. Um, that's a real evolving science at the moment, uh, whether there's a need for supplemental omega-7 or not uh, is, is a live question. Mm -hmm. um, we're, I think pro we're probably going to talk more about the threes and sixes uh, than the sevens and nines. Brilliant. And I want to put it through a frame, Dr. Bull, because I think it's really, really important of the four horsemen, the uh, first being cardiovascular disease, the impact of not having enough omega-3s uh, based on you know, the omega index, having too many omega-6s uh, and uh, specific linoleic acid uh, seems to be found in many different places. And not only the ratios, but the volumes and the concentrations, which are crucially important. And then cancer, the second horseman. And then third, neurodegenerative conditions. I had uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen on the show a fantastic mm -hmm. podcast and talking about the cognoscopy and how important uh, omega-3s are, EPA, DHA, and also just the understanding of the very limited conversion of ALA to EPA and DHA uh, because we see a significant amount of vegetarians or, or vegans here and the importance of that. And then the last uh, one is metabolic diseases, the last horseman, things like uh, diabetes and that. So I think those are important because someone's listening and saying, okay, Dr. Bill's going to tell us about omega-3s, but why are they so important? I've got a cardiovascular predisposition or an issue. So start yeah. with cardiovascular disease, and then we can go from there. In the back of your mind, on your radar, as we talk, I do want to talk about the number one symptom that I've you know, had patients complain about over 24 years. It's called fatigue. I think it's mental and emotional fatigue. And it's just been prolific in the last three years. And so put that in the back of uh, your mind there, Dr. Bull, because I think it's really, really important. Yeah, and fatigue, unfortunately, is one of those things that has many causes. Multifactorial, we say, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's certainly one of which can be a fatty acid imbalance. Um, but I, I would not want to come across as saying if you have fatigue, then you definitely have a fatty acid imbalance. I mean, that may or may not be the case, um, but that's certainly in the background. You're right. As mm. is, as, as you know, as is inflammation is in mm. the background of all yep. of this. 
but but Corey, possibly, let's, let's yeah. start with because you started speaking about fatigue now is do you see because you've done so many tests you know one thing again is empirical evidence you know sometimes the science well the science is always important but empirical evidence who you're dealing with what you're sharing you've done so many tests you've been running omega quant for so long what have people said with regards to fatigue and getting their index correct well that's a, that's a good question um it's it's such a good question that i haven't got a good answer um because we as you you say we have done a lot of tests at omega quant and we'll get into the details of that later but omega quant is a company we started uh, some 12 years ago to analyze blood omega-3 or fatty acid patterns uh yeah we've done uh, you know hundreds of thousands if not millions of tests uh what we don't have is a lot of feedback mm -hmm. so we, we get a drop of blood on a dry blood spot on a card we get a name we get a age date of birth and we get an email address that's really all we know we don't know what diseases these folks have we don't know how they feel uh, maybe once in a while somebody will write in and say boy you know i'm now that i've got my omega-3 index up in the right zone i feel a lot better um, but that's very anecdotal um, so I, I wish i had a medical history on every person who has done the omega-3 index, but sadly we don't okay let's go to cardiovascular disease then and just you know how important omega-3s are and maybe you can put it in the frame of epa dha and ala sure so just to define our terms maybe everybody knows but ala is the plant omega-3 fatty acid that's 18 carbons long uh and it's the one that uh can be to some extent limited extent con converted to epa and dha which are the the fish the marine omega-3 fatty acids um, everybody has all of these in their body to some extent um, even vegans who eat eat no fish or seafood um, will have some epa and dha because that's been made from ala in the liver um, but it, it, the question is does it is enough epa and dha made for optimal health uh, that's that's the question i would say no that the uh, best way to get the optimal levels of epa and dha in your blood are to eat them directly made not have a, not depend on synthesis from something else mm -hmm. um, so epa and dha i uh the long words uh, thank god there are abbreviations those are the two we are interested in primarily in chemistry and or in in health and nutrition uh, the cardiovascular connection began uh, with a with discoveries in uh, by Danish scientists in Greenland in the 1970s, where they explored a what was a conundrum to them and and the general scientific community, uh, where in the 70s we we knew high cholesterol diets, high saturated fat diets uh, were really bad for heart disease, and people were dropping dead from this kind of stuff. Uh, but these Danish investigators were aware of uh, groups of Eskimos, uh, Inuits, uh, living in Greenland. Greenland was actually part of Denmark, uh, owned by Denmark, uh, that uh, whose diet was absolutely miserable from the general worldview. That they ate almost no fruits and vegetables. They ate lots of, of blubber and they ate fish. Fish was good, but, they, they, you know... Uh, high cholesterol, high fat foods. And they seem to have, from what evidence they had, very little uh, acute myocardial infarction, heart attack, very few heart attacks, uh, and certainly very few deaths from heart attacks. Uh, and this was didn't make any sense at all. Um, and so these Danish guys went to, to Greenland, took blood samples, took food samples, studied lifestyles, and after some years of machinations about this, they discovered that there was some really unusual fatty acids in the blood and in the food of these people. And they were the omega-3s, EPA and DHA. Great high levels compared to what they thought was normal in Denmark, which had really, really low levels. So they began thinking, well, I wonder if EPA and DHA, these omega-3s have anything to do with this heart disease thing the heart attack thing and the view in the 70s of the cause of heart attacks was a blood clot in the heart a blood clot in the, the coronary arteries mm. that feed heart muscle 
And so these, in, the, Jorn Dyerberg, particularly as a Danish scientist, um, did some experiments and he gave EPA, he put, looked at blood clotting in people that had a high EPA level and found that people had high EPA, didn't, their blood didn't clot very fast. <laughs> and so he said, aha, that explains it. It's the omega-3s, particularly EPA. He didn't pay much attention to, to DHA at the time. EPA is, is preventing blood clots. That's why they're not having heart attacks. And that was the original mechanism by which omega-3s were thought to reduce risk for heart disease. Now, later on, we discovered that the omega-3s also have an effect on blood lipids, uh, and meaning cholesterol and triglyceride. And then we talk about lipoproteins, LDL, HDL, et cetera, the particles that carry the blood lipids. But we we found one of our, our original discoveries, what the omega-3 uh, fatty acids in the diet will lower blood triglyceride levels uh, rather uniquely. Other fats don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was kind of an, a new, another mechanism by which the omega-3s might help. Brilliant. So that's kind of where it all started. Let me ask you a clinical question. Is it the lack of EPA and DHA in the diet that makes saturated fat possibly pernicious and cause significant cardiovascular disease? Because it sounds like this original study in Greenland, they were having a lot of saturated fat, but they weren't having cardiovascular disease. So is it the lack of EPA and DHA in your view that is causing significant cardiovascular disease? I think it's, yes, I think it's the lack, um, the lack of omega-3s that's the problem because saturated fats are not as dangerous when you've got high levels of omega-3. Um, it, it just balances out better. It's, it's properly tuned once you've got the right amount of omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9 and saturates. Uh, there, yeah. There's a balance there. But is it more about the balance than the actual saturated fat? Because if you go to a physician who says, yeah. stop having the saturated fats. Now we talk about omega-6 and vilify omega-6. We should never vilify omega-6. It's the right balance once again. It's the dose and the balance. And this is yeah. what I'm concerned about out there is physicians are saying, oh, no, you need to decrease saturated fats, decrease uh, you know, your linoleic acid. Look, sometimes we look at the concentrations of linoleic acid and omega-6 is really, really high. The balance might be good because the omega-3s are really high, but you're not getting a good interpretation. So give us your perspective on saturated fats, because in the test that we do steric acid, palmitic acid is measured. I was exactly right, you know, in the middle, 0% off the standard deviation. But what is your view on how important it is to decrease saturated fat if someone is having significant omega-3s? Uh, that's a, it is a good question. Um and the test you're talking about is the blood omega-3 tests, which we do at Omega Quant. And I think we need to distinguish between saturated fat levels as in that test, because we're fundamentally measuring blood fatty acids, uh, saturated fatty acids in the blood as a percent of the total. Um, it, it's not very well linked to how much you eat. Uh, there is a there is a, a thousand steps between putting some saturated fat in your mouth and from having your blood blood cells, particularly red blood cells, be made in the bone marrow, and and in making those cells, there's a very specific recipe that the the bone marrow knows it needs to make for a red blood cell, and it takes certain amount of fat saturated fat, it doesn't take everything. So you eat a lot of saturated fat or little saturated fat. It's not going to show up necessarily in your blood fatty, blood saturated fat levels. That's different for omega-3. That's different for omega-6, which are only coming from yeah. the diet. But right. saturated fat comes from the diet and from internal biology and synthesis. So it's not a great marker. Saturated mm -hmm. fat is not a great marker. Now, I, I guess your question was, is is back to your question is it too much saturated fat or too little omega-3 well i think it's probably both a little bit i i definitely think it's too little omega-3 and when i say omega-3 i mean epa dha mm -hmm. um, but it, how higher or lower intakes of saturated fat in the context of a high omega-3 really hasn't been systematically studied it's a good question that would be a that would bear bear examination Brilliant. 
And then how does it actually lower triglycerides? I mean, that's been something we've measured for a long time. Trigs in terms of the detrimental effect on the cardiovascular system. How does omega-3 lower triglycerides? Well, you've, you again, we're talking about triglycerides in the blood. Okay. So the way any, the level of anything in the blood, whether it's cholesterol or sodium or, or triglycerides, uh, is determined is by the rate uh, input in the blood and the rate at which it's removed from the blood. So uh, the omega-3s have an effect on both the rate of input of omega-3, excuse me, of triglycerides in the blood. They're made in the liver and they're, they're secreted into the blood from the liver. And the omega-3s will slow down the synthesis of triglycerides. And on the other side, there is an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, which is an enzyme that lines the coating of all the capillaries in the body. And that enzyme will break down triglycerides and take the constituent parts into the tissues for energy, typically. Mm -hmm. So the omega-3s will accelerate the activity of lipoprotein lipase and decrease the synthesis of triglycerides in the liver. So net effect, triglyceride levels go down. And that decreases apolipoprotein B, these lipoproteins that have been shown to be detrimental uh, to health and increase cardiovascular disease. The lipoproteins carry the cholesterol. And so we've been more concerned about the carriers. You know, the example I give is cars on the road, carrying passengers, the passengers of the cholesterol, the cars of the lipoproteins, your LDLs, your VDLs, good, good. you know, and this is very important, and your IDLs. And that apolipoprotein B will then come down often with changes in diet because triglycerides come down and then omega-3s. So this is very important for cardiovascular patients. And give us your own words. How important is it if someone has, you know, or predisposed to cardiovascular disease or has already had a cardiovascular event to ensure that they take omega-3s? Uh, very important. To your to your your question, uh, particularly people at high risk, whether by family history or by personal history, of uh, uh, a future cardiovascular having a high omega three is, in my view, is job number one. Um, but I want to back up just a second to your point about ApoB, which is, as you said, it's it's the protein. It's kind of the engine of the car that's driving around and the, that's driving these little particles around. Um, Taking omega, increasing your omega-3 intake per se, like taking omega-3 supplements, for example, not changing anything else in your diet, that's not going to lower your ApoB levels. It's not going to lower your total cholesterol. It's not going to total lower your LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. Um, lowering triglycerides is a separate thing. And there's the triglycerides are carried in particles that haven't got much ApoB on them. So even though there's less triglyceride-rich particles that do have ApoB, there's uh, the number of ApoB molecules is pretty small. So the, you really won't see a change. You shouldn't expect to see a cholesterol-lowering or ApoB-lowering effect of taking omega-3 um, per okay. se. If, if you lower your saturated fat intake, that will lower ApoB levels, but that's not going to help with your omega-3 status. Brilliant. Okay, so let's talk about what the index should be, because I think it's a good sort of, you know, segue now, what sure. should people aim for, and then at the same time, to make it very practical, generally, how much EPA and DHA is at 1440, there's so much debate, it's debatable on individuals, obviously, the epigenetic expression of this, that's why testing is so important, but give yep. us your view on how much EPA and DHA someone would need on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, okay, and just to back up, the, the the test we're talking about here is an omega-3 index test, a test we came up with uh, 20 years ago or so. Um, and that is defined as the EPA and DHA content of your red blood cells, red blood cell membranes. Uh, the membranes contain, omega-3s find their home throughout the body in cell membranes, and they do most of their good work in helping optimize the function of cell membranes. And that's hugely important, every cell. So the easiest cell to get at is a blood cell, because you can take a blood sample. You can get in there, the blood is roughly 50-50, red blood cells and plasma, or fundamentally water. 
Uh, so we isolate, we, we, we get the omega-3 level in the red blood cell. It's a good reflection of the whole body. And we express the EPA and DHA content of the red cell as a percent of the fatty acid, all the fatty acids in the red cell membrane. Uh, which is a very common way of expressing omega-3 content or status. Uh, it, the, the levels vary from at the very end, low end, maybe 2% of fatty acids is EPA and DHA. That's very low. Um, up to 10, 12, maybe even 15% you see in some like Japanese cohorts of people who eat lots and lots of omega-3. It, it can, but that's the range you're looking at, say 2 to 12% roughly. Uh, we think 8% and above is really the sweet spot for reducing risk for a variety of conditions. We originally proposed 8% for reducing risk for cardiovascular death. This was 2004. Uh, but I think that 8% target uh, is really a good one for all kinds of conditions, whether it's cognitive or cardiovascular. Um, uh, we see that's, that's showing up over the last 20 years of research. Uh, we have these categories of under 4% is bad, uh, 4 to 8 kind of intermediate. And that's kind of where most people are in Western cultures is maybe 5-ish, 6% maybe, um, who are not going out of their way to eat fish or eat, take supplements. Uh, interestingly, the younger people have lower levels, uh, partly because that's the way they eat. And for other reasons, there may be actually metabolic mm -hmm. reasons. But as people get older, their omega-3 levels drift up. It's about a unit, a full omega-3 index unit. Uh, we've seen that between, say, age 40 and age 70. It might go up by over one unit. Um, whether it's because people eat more fish or just omega-3 slowly accumulate, we don't know. Uh, but in any event, when, when people are doing the blood tests, and you've done a lot of them, 8% is the sweet spot. It doesn't mean that 7.9% is bad. I mean... People get this very black and white view of these blood tests. They need to look at them on a continuum. Uh, we know that 95% of Americans are below 8% on the omega-3 index test, approximately. The vast majority. Uh, so you're, you're pretty safe in assuming somebody's going to be either in that intermediate or low zone uh, when you do a, a blood test on someone. Uh, we think it's really important to follow the omega-3 index test, just like you, your doctor would follow your cholesterol level. You have a high cholesterol, mm. you're at risk for heart disease, doctor puts you on a diet or a drug, a statin drug, and then they test your cholesterol again to see if it's working for you. Is your cholesterol low enough? Now, without all the arguments about whether cholesterol yeah. is, yeah, 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 we're not going to go there. The The principle of the idea is, you measure someone's status, you make some kind of intervention to help change that status, it's a risk factor, and then you double check to see if you've actually accomplished it. Mm -hmm. So that's what the omega-3 index is really there for, for uh, initial assessment, and then to see if you're taking, when you've increased your intake, are you increasing enough for you? And th that was your question, how much, right? How much do you need? Uh, and again, as you already said, it's individual, like everything else in life. Uh, so taking a, a EPA and DHA, say a, a gram a day, 1,000 milligrams, the average intake in the West is in the neighborhood of 100 milligrams a day. That's average. Um, most people, I think the median intake is zero, like oh. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a few people on the long, on the end eating a lot, raises the average. But in any event, 100 is usual. If you take 10 times as much of that, you might go from an omega-3 index of 4% to maybe 7% uh, on average. Uh, our calculations have shown that if you start at 5% and you want to go to 8%, it takes about 1,400 milligrams a day. Right. Again, but there's some people will do that with with 500 milligrams a day. Five, some people take 2,000 milligrams a day to do that. But that's why you have to test yourself. Let's talk about that before I get you to speak about the research and the testing and the FDA drugs that have been improved. Because if I look at my testing and mine sitting at 5%, but that 5% on my index, and I've just got this right in front of me now because I think it's in uh, very, very important is that's with 2.4 grams of EPA DHA. 
So, you know, I'm really, really concerned taking so much and I can only get it up to, to 5%. Uh, is there sort so of that, gen genetic this changes? is you or this this is you or this is a patient Steve this is me this is me ah, you know oh. so this is me sitting with uh, a five percent uh you know EPA. The index, take, yeah. taking 2.4 grams a day taking 2.4 grams a day and uh, I haven't increased that but it would you know I'll ask you the question you know the index is so important uh, do we just carry on increasing? I know you had, I think it was 25 grams initially in 1980 of salmon oil. Uh, and, and that was a fascinating study that was done. But, you know, these things are costly. You know, we, we look at uh, different products. I'm not going to put them, the, I don't want to, there's brands, but there's 1440 yeah. from certain companies. The one that I take is in an oil base. It's 2.4 grams every single day. And it uh, didn't shift it much at all. Pretty state, you know, pretty much the same. So do I increase it now or, you know, it's so, it seems like there's such genetic variability. That's your story is really unusual. I mean, you probably know that from your clinical practice. Um, I would, I'd be really surprised to see somebody taking that much omega-3 and have an index of only 5%. Uh, so there's either something going on with absorption of it or the uh, destruction, I guess you'd say, of EPA and DHA somewhere in the system where it doesn't get into the tissues. Um, and I don't honestly know what that would be, but that's a, a really surprising story. And I'm sure you've tested several times. So this is not just a one-off, a lab error. Lab errors happen, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, you're, you're, you're kind of a outlier. Okay. You've probably been told that before. In other contexts, so but let it, me let me ask you: taking amigas with what? Because this is something that I haven't got an answer from from many people on the podcast. Because I've I've done a lot of fasting. Uh, I've got a fat percentage of about ten percent. A lot of endurance running, uh, a lot of training every single day. Now the question is: How should people, including myself, uh, take omega threes, and can that have an impact on the index? Yes. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, you look fit from the, at least from the chest up. I can't tell the rest, but it's uh, <laughs> from what you say, well, we do know that athletes, particularly kind of what we'd call extreme athletes, uh, do have a low omega-3. Um, and if we study, but like before and after a, a race, omega-3 levels go down. Uh, and we think it's because they're burning. It, it, omega threes are energy. They're fat. Every type of fat can be burned for energy. Mm -hmm. And when uh, people are burning a lot of energy, they do burn up some of the EPA and DHA, which you know should be stored for other purposes. But if your body demands energy, first come, first serve. Energy is, gets it. So that can be part of your explanation. Um, and taking it with, it, it's always important to take omega threes with food particularly with food that has some fat in it uh, that will the, the fat in the meal will stimulate all your digestive juices uh, and help with the emulsification and the absorption of the omega-3s um, this is particularly true if you take you're not but people who take an ethyl ester form of omega-3 uh, the having a having it with a meal is, is very important because taking on an empty stomach um, is not going to be absorbed. And, and, and I'm interested in your comment about fasting. I Nobody's ever really studied the effects of chronic fasting on omega-3 status. It's a great study. It's a great question. Um, and, and how exactly one would do it is a little bit challenging. It's hard to r randomize people to, you're going to fast, you're not. Uh, you know. So that, that's the way you do it if people were lab rats, uh, but they're not. So that could have an effect. I mean, that mm -hmm. you're you're an anomaly in the sense of you exercise a lot, you fast a lot. I wouldn't. Maybe that's not so surprising that your omega three index is not going up. So maybe doubling it might be a, an interesting experiment. Okay. So going to five grams is not a problem. It sounds like there's no upper limit. Is that correct, Doctor Bill? No upper limit that we know of. I mean, in theory. You know, the, the general belief is any the, any molecule you, or anything you can take in too great a quantity. There's eventually some kind of a limit, mm. even okay. in water. Okay. But 
Uh, we don't know what that is at this mm -hmm. point. And it's not something people with an omega-3 index of 10, 12% are just fine. They yeah. live, there's no, no side effects that anybody knows about. Um, nobody has done an experiment in, you know, a thousand people who take, who have an omega-3 index of 15 or 18%. Mm -hmm. There's, there aren't, you know, there's 17 people like that on the planet, you know, so we, you can't do a study that high. Yeah. But you've got two so, great questions now that you've said that you're going to take back and uh, possibly look at studies. You've got the environment and you've got the skills and the expertise that we've got to look at because uh, if it sounds like it to me from the initial studies, it's not saturated fat. It's the balance of saturated fat and omega-3s that's crucially important. And I think that's very important for people to understand. And, you know, yeah. I think uh, it, it, instead of vilifying these things. Yeah. Right, right. And we're we're kind of in the early stages of developing a study uh, within a, a cohort called the Adventist Health Study, which is a Seventh-day Adventist study that's <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventist religious uh, Protestant group that uh, believes in fasting and believes in uh, vegetarianism. And so many of their adherents are vegetarian. And so thankfully, years ago, a group of these folks were collected, studied, and then watched over time, and and they have a lower risk for a variety of chronic diseases. Some of your four horsemen mm. uh, are don't are, are not as common when you have a vegetarian lifestyle. But what we don't know is how does omega three levels play into that? Do people who are vegetarian their whole life and have a low omega three actually have a higher risk for heart disease than vegetarians who have a high omega three? I mean, it could be the vegetarianism per se cancels out the benefit of omega-3. You don't, if you're a vegetarian, you don't need more omega-3. That could be the story. I doubt it is, but that could be. We haven't studied it. Maybe just summarize sort of any research, overall meta-analyses on, like, does omega-3 supplementation or the correct index give you a 40% decrease of a cardiovascular event? Someone's listening. Because I do know the FDA has approved now some drugs, two drugs from what I believe, so give us an indication of the science and then just the story behind the FDA, FDA and these drugs. Yeah, uh, two currently approved uh, on the market drugs in, in the U.S. and around the world typically are <clears throat> one's called Lodeza here. It's called Omicor in other parts of the world. It is an ethyl ester EPA plus DHA combination of EPA and DHA. The other one is an ethyl ester. It's just EPA called Vasipa in the U.S. I think it's pretty much universally called VASIPA. Um, and there have been, you know, fairly recent study with VASIPA, the EPA only product that showed in a randomized trial in high risk people, really lower risk of heart disease, variety of outcomes. Uh, Loveza per se has not ever actually been studied in, in a, in the indicated dose, which is four grams a day four grams a day, ethyl ester of EPA or four grams a day of, e of Loveza. Um, that dose itself has never actually been tested to reduce risk of cardiovascular disease, that product. Um, but, and so it's, it's indication from the FDA is just for people that have very high triglycerides. That's what it's for. Uh, mm -hmm. Can doctors use it off label? Sure. Um, and is, are the drugs fundamentally any different than the supplements? Well, EPA and DHA are EPA and DHA. The chemical is the chemical is the chemical. You can almost look at omega-3 supplements as generic yeah. drugs in a sense. Um, uh, that's the whole other discussion about the regulation of supplements, yada, yada, yada. But fundamentally, EPA and DHA are there. The, the trials, um, you mentioned meta-analysis. Of course, a meta-analysis is a analysis of the, of paper of other studies pooling of data uh, we've done quite a bit of that uh, meta-analysis work in the area of omega-3 blood levels not supplementation but blood levels of omega-3 in populations around the world uh, our most recent uh, paper that i was able to lead looked at risk for death from any cause uh, over a window of time uh, in people that have between low and high levels of omega-3. And we had some 40 or 50,000 people in the study. And we saw that people who had the highest omega-3 levels 
were the least likely to die in the, the window of time that we were studying. Of course, if you, you wait long enough, everybody dies. Okay, let's everybody knows that. Uh, so you don't, you, you, you always have to have the question, uh, say between age 65 and 80, who dies? All right, that's the question. Uh, and the people at the highest omega-3 levels, something around 8%, as it turns out, um, were the most uh, protected against, I'll call premature death. Uh, and whether it's cardiovascular disease, cancer, or everything else, it doesn't make any difference. Higher omega-3 was, was associated with lower risk. So that's very cool. We've seen that with cardiovascular disease. We're going to start a study on uh, um, cancer. We've actually looked at omega-6 in that same question uh, and, and, and cardiovascular disease. and seen that higher levels of omega-6 kind of contra to the idea that a lot of people have that omega-6 is bad linoleic, higher linoleic acid levels in two different studies, uh, these same kinds of studies, higher blood levels of linoleic acid, which means higher intakes of linoleic, you can't make it, uh, were associated with lower risk of cardiovascular death and, and having di getting diabetes. Uh, so those two are important outcomes. Uh, and it suggests to me that uh, omega-6 is not the bad guy here. It's the lack of omega-3 that's the bad guy. Um, and so I, I may have dig digressed from your question, but uh, mm -hmm. I'll come back to it if you want me to readdress some. Just give us, a, I mean, someone's listening. Give us a number. Is it going to reduce all-cause mortality by 40%, cardiovascular disease by 30%? Someone's listening out there. And, I, and the reason I'm stressing this is that people don't understand the value of omega-3s and, and, and they just don't carry on taking them. And there's very few supplements and we're not a you know supplement pushes here people have to make their own choices or to eat fish i'm going to talk about that now because we've discussed the dosage and the supplements but it's crucially important according to me it's probably the most important one of the most top three supplements that i give out there just because people do not get it in a diet and there hasn't been a single patient or client that i've measured in i don't know how many years now that hasn't had the correct index so, you know, chances are you're not going to have the correct index or the correct ratio. So give us some sort of figures in terms of all risk mortality and cardiovascular disease reduction. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not extreme. It's, it's not like you're reducing your risk of, uh, for death in a given window of time by 50%. I mean, it's not that that's crazy. Mm -hmm. that, that one factor alone could have that kind of an impact. It's about 15 to 17% or so lower risk of death, which should be spectacularly attractive to the medical community. Huge. But Huge. it's not. I mean, it's it, it's a nutrient. It's completely safe. There's no side effects. I mean, we're not talking about a drug. We're talking about a nutrient that if you have the right levels, allows you to live longer and healthier. Uh, that should be something. But you're right. People don't feel a low omega-3 level. Well, you don't feel a low vitamin A or vitamin C level or a low protein level. There's no feelings about that, no symptoms in the classic sense. So yeah, people have to just trust the science. So where have I heard that term? Uh, that <clears throat> here's the science that says people with low levels of omega-3 don't do well. Even randomized trials have shown increased benefit or increased uh, life expectancy for people with higher omega-3 levels. Um, so it, it's there, it's safe to do. There's virtually no downside to optimizing your omega-3 level. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a continual fan. I'm a cheerleader for that, as mm -hmm. you are, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that very much. Uh, you have a very special community you are able to communicate with, and mm -hmm. that's what we need. I haven't got that other than this kind of invitation. Um, so, you know, good for you. Keep pressing on that. People mm -hmm. need to optimize their omega-3 levels. Yeah. However they want to do it. I mean, they can do it with fish. Yeah. Good. Or let, let wrap up uh, in one sort of uh, short uh, sentence or two, if you can. Cancer and neurodegenerative conditions, even sort of mental health and mental performance, maybe anxiety, depression, and then metabolic diseases, the importance of omega-3. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> right, we, we we got a hard stop going, I understand. Yeah. So yeah, we looked in, in uh, the Framingham study, we looked at omega-3 levels in the blood and risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. People at the highest levels were 
50% less likely to develop dementia compared to people in the lowest levels. Okay, does that mean the omega-3s were doing it? Not necessarily, but it's a good sign. Uh, it's very hard to do randomized trials on dementia. It's such a long, long-term uh, disease. Um, <clears throat> diabetes, we've seen the same kind of thing. People with the highest omega-3 levels are least likely to develop diabetes. So that's your metabolic diseases. Uh, and we're working on chronic kidney disease. We see people less likely to develop kidney disease uh, and maybe lung diseases. We've seen people that in the COVID world, that people who had the highest omega-3s were the least likely to get COVID or to die from COVID. Uh, it's just omega-3s are it everywhere. Now, cancer is a place where it's not as clear. Um, I don't think we can say with as much surety that the omega-3s really reduce risk for cancer. They certainly don't increase it, but uh, that needs a lot more study, um, and partly because there are so many different kinds of cancer. There's one kind of cardiovascular disease. There's a lot of different kinds of cancer. And so the, what we saw in our study of, of several thousand people, the risk for dying of cancer was lower with the highest omega-3 levels. Um, but that's I've written across board all cancers, uh, and I, I think we need a lot more study in that area. Uh, so brilliant brilliant just possibly maybe on brain fog uh, memory mental mm -hmm. performance uh, cognitive ability i think is there something to say about omega-3s and in that area we do a lot of corporate work and they're really concerned about sort of mental fatigue and mental performance and so uh, we've recommended yeah. omega-3s but it would be nice to get your perspective on that no, uh, that my perspective is that just from all the other benefits of omega three, those things should be should be impacted uh, and beneficially. Um, proving that omega threes reduce brain fog, like after chemotherapy, like after in long COVID, uh, for example, um, or they they improve uh, acuity in in thinking for adult. I mean babies okay we're just now starting but talking about a 60 year old who now wants to start taking supplements are they going to get more brilliant uh, probably not you know i mean there's a, a long history of of abuse that's gone on uh, you can't turn that battleship around with just one supplement starting you know when you're 65 uh, so i i think we have a lot of work to do um i'm optimistic that omega-3s are going to be beneficial in all those areas you mentioned mm -hmm. um, but i can't point to definitive randomized trials to prove that it's true but Brilliant. again the downside is zero the potential upside is great good now i've got a couple of products here that i want to talk like this is mackerel uh, it's in olive oil uh, wild caught salmon and sardines because people these are questions and it was interesting and in, in, in just looking at since i've started eating a lot more because i thought possibly my body's not processing it in the supplement form. I'm not sure. It maybe needed a carrier taking so yeah. much and keeping the index so low. But uh, let me start with sardines now because this is going to go into YouTube as well. And it's interesting. Per 100 grams here, there's 26 grams of fat. 5.2 grams is saturated. So out of those 26 grams of fat, 23 grams of protein how much do you think out of the 100 grams here? Because I separate, I have half of these. I try and get this every day or every second day. One of these between mackerel, it's quite tough. Mackerel, uh, sardines. Uh, I'm not an anchovy fan, uh, but these three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't get it. Yeah, okay. Because, it, you know, it's important, you know, 26 grams of fat and 5.2 grams of saturated how much EPA and DHA is going to be in 100 grams of sardines? Probably in the neighborhood of two or three grams. Two, um, three. Again, you're packed in olive oil. You're not packed in sardine oil. Yeah. You can get them packed in sardine oil. You know, it's a little more intense flavor, as you might see. So the actual fish, the oil itself, the added oil, olive oil is not going to add any omega-3. So that the 26 grams of oil there, most of that's probably coming from olive oil. 26 and grams I, of fat, Dr. Bull. 26 yeah, grams sure. of fat and 23 that, grams of protein. Okay. 
And that I put, what my question is, is that assuming you're eating everything in that can, including all of the olive oil? Mm. Yeah, or yeah. is that assuming you're wiping all the fish off or just dripping the oil off and then just eating the fish? No, I, I don't know what they're assuming in that calculation. Okay. So you say two to three grams. So I'm going to have this whole thing to get two, three grams of EPA. Well, 100, 100 grams of actual fish. I mean, they're small. They're little guys, mm. right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> they haven't got that much oil in them per se. I mean, again, in that can, most of the fat is from the added oil. Okay. But still That's a great a source. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I would applaud you for eating sardines every other day, a whole can. That's fantastic. Now, mackerel here, which is supposed to be an oily fish, and, you know, I started looking at it here. The total fat, fat in 100 grams here is, is 3.1 grams of fat, 24 grams of protein. Saturated fat is 1.1 grams. So if you take that out, it's like two grams of fat out of this whole mackerel. I mean, how much EPA and DHA are you getting in mackerel now? What's that packed in? This is packed in olive oil. No, in brine. Sorry, this is in brine. So that's in water. So yeah. they don't add any. They're not adding any. You should actually look at a sardine pack packed in brine. Yeah. That'll tell you how much fat's actually in the sardines not in the added oil hmm. and that would be a little more i mean that's why that product is is low in fat because they're not adding any fat they're just yeah. packing in seawater essentially yeah i mean that's two grams of macro how much epa is going to be in dha is going to I, you be know you know i i'd have to look in the the tables <laughs> so i can't remember <laughs> i mean it's one of those what we think about smash you know you know the acronym smash mm -hmm. fish and the sardines typically say uh, and then mackerel sma uh, uh some would say anchovies i don't think anybody eats anchovies <clears throat> they throw them away off their caesar salad uh or off their pizza uh the a should be albacore tuna in my view because that's a good source of omega-3 not chunk light but white tuna albacore. Yeah. sma s uh salmon and herring those yeah. are the the five Big fish one. that really I mean, compared to things like orange roughy, tilapia, cod, uh, shrimp, lobster, they don't have much omega-3 in them because they haven't got much fat in them. Correct. They're seafood, but they, yeah. Anyway. Now, salmon fillets in brine. Here it says 10 grams of fat, 1.8 okay. grams of saturated. So then you're looking at oh. probably 8 grams of fat. So how much EPA do you think you'd be getting in 100 grams of this? Of oh, this? In, 100, in 100 grams of that, you're probably getting about... Again, two, two-ish yes. grams of EPA DHA. Okay. I mean, right. You know, still, that's what, you know, 20 times the average American intake. Just there of omega-3, just that can. Okay. That's so that puts it in a bit of perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It's not a silver bullet, but it's, it's, you know, if people could eat like you're eating, those cans of canned food, can they probably wouldn't need to take supplements. You think so? I mean, not runners or fasters. <laughs> <laughs> well, the yeah. average person, the normal yeah. person, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, brilliant. Tell us what you're excited about with regard to Omega-3. Obviously, you've been in this field like 43 years. Uh, I think it's going to be something that uh, is going to grow and develop, like you said, the future of Omega-3s. Uh, where's it going? And things like your... So instinct, you know, oh, omega-3s are going to be shown to improve eye health or sinuses or intolerances or allergies or, you know, give us sort of your things that you're excited about with regard to this field. I think they're going to, as they've been, as they get examined, uh, you, you mentioned autoimmune diseases. I mean, there's a, a recent study um, pointing to high, even only 800 milligrams a day in healthy people have reduced the risk for autoimmune disease. That's that's cool. I mean, so what would two grams or four grams a day do in that context? We don't know. Hasn't been studied. Um, so I think there's a lot of our, our chronic diseases that could be helped, maybe not eradicated. We're not going to eradicate diseases, okay? But reduce the risk uh, for, for, with higher omega-3. It's just we, everything is better, as they say, with blue bonnet on it. I mean, that's just an old butter commercial. I, everything's better with omega-3 index of eight now what i i really hope to see in the future is that the omega-3 testing whether it's the omega-3 index or blood well, i don't care 
whatever the omega-3 index testing, uh, that it becomes as common as a cholesterol test, as routine, as important. Um, I really think that your annual physical exam, when they draw that blood panel, should include omega-3 because it's it tells you more about your risk for at least cardiovascular disease than cholesterol does, but they're, they're measuring cholesterol all the time. But it's much more informative. Uh, a low omega-3 is more predictive of risk for heart disease than a, than a high cholesterol is, far and away. Uh, so in any event, my hope for the future is that it will become a routine test and that people doc, once once it's on the, the the lab slip at an exam and a doctor has to look at it and he has to look and see that there's an asterisk on it that says this is low then he or she feels a little more obligated to do something about it if if there's no data there's no lab test it's all very vague and you know I'll just eat better eat more fish yeah you know, but i want to see a number on a lab slip that's going to motivate a change in health Brilliant. Well, I want to just declare favor and blessing over you, Dr. Bill Harris, a real pioneer calling to take in this field uh, so far forward. And it's uh, just an honor to have met you. And hopefully we can just chat offline about Omega Quant because uh, I just see you're a man. I've listened to you on podcasts and you've written, I think, I think you had so many published studies already and you've just been committed to the cause and changing people's lives. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me, Steve. It's been, been fun talking with you.